This squad, with the power they have on their day, they can do anything they want. Hello and welcome to Sturbridge FC Women's Monthly Press Conference. Today I'm joined by Mike Harris and Hannah Fishwick. How are you both? Alright, yeah, okay, good, thank you. Yeah, good, yeah. Thank, thank you for joining us. Um, congratulations, Mike, um, with you and Tasha for the recent results in your interim period. Uh, how have you both found uh, this law? Yeah, um, didn't expect uh, to ever be sat in this seat, really. Um, obviously, it's been a crazy few weeks. Um, with that, I think I think we've just both enjoyed it as much as we can. It's been a, a crazy two weeks, crazy 14 days. We've had more moments and memories now to speak of. Um, but working with Tash is a delight. Um, I don't think anybody kind of ever looked at our dynamic over the last four years and thought, you know what, there's something we need to add to this or there's something that we need to bring onto this. But it's only when you bring in a person like Tash, do you realise how much and how useful, you know, somebody like Tash is? Um, I remember kind of Jonas Alvidal, the, the Arsenal manager, saying that if you don't have a woman in your camp, you're not, you know, your your management team isn't anywhere near as effective as it could be. And I, I couldn't agree more. Um, I think she's been <clears throat> a breath of fresh air for all of us. Um, like I said, not that we, we thought we ever needed it, but she's just a walking advertisement for how how good and how important having a, a, a female coach can be. Um, but not not only, you know, not only just a, a female, but a fantastic person in that too. So she's been brilliant. Um, and the players have been great too. And they made it a lot of fun. Um, and, and it's always nice getting points on the board. So that's, that's made it even more enjoyable. Have you had any immediate challenges uh, in the time uh, which couldn't wait until a new manager was appointed that you've had to act upon? Yeah, I wouldn't say challenges. I think we're always looking at what we can do to better support the group, to give the group what they need, to to progress the club and the setup. Um, those conversations have been ongoing and and, and always happen. Um, I don't think we were ever just going to sit on our hands and wait for uh, decisions to be made or any of that stuff. We always wanted to to carry on the progress that we were going for. Filed uh, was too much of an important game for us to sit and wait for somebody else to make choices so you know we we make we make big decisions we work quickly um you know we brought players up from the reserves uh, that week and gave them opportunities and it paid off for us um and um like i said it's all happened very quickly and feels like it's been a very long two weeks but um to have so much success off the back of that has been a, a, a nice a nice bit of validation for us all Mike, um, Sturbridge invited applications for the manager's position uh, to be sent to the club now later than the 22nd of September. It's now nearly a week further on than that. Is there any development on this at all? Um, yes, but it will be announced in due course. Um, what I would say is that you won't get to the Burnley game without knowing exactly what conversations have been going on. But the club is in such a good position, the team is in such a good position that we're fortunate enough to be able to be really patient with the process and this is the kind of thing that you want to do well when you want to do it right so that you don't have to do it again in six months time or 12 months time so you know by by following the right processes by doing everything right we know we're doing the best thing for the group we know we're doing the best thing for the club um there's no selfish intention anywhere it is purely and simply a, we want to make sure that we give the right opportunities out for people to apply for for everything to happen as it should do um and because we're in such a good place we don't need to rush that so it's going well everything everything is moving as it should be but no exciting updates as of yet uh, thank you mike hannah you recently hit uh, 50 appearances for Stairbridge this month um how would you best describe the way you and the squad have developed in that time um i think just the general you know us being able to play football has improved if I'm being honest. Like obviously I started in tier five with them. Um and the improvements have been massive physically, tactically, technically. Um and I also think the group dynamics changed a little as like culture, but the culture of 
us all enjoying football and playing together and being friends with each other has carried on. Um, so I think it's improved technically and tactically, but like the general consensus of us all getting along and grafting for each other has stayed the same, which has been great. How have you and the rest of the players adapted with all three managers of the three women's teams this season, this season uh, changing in the summer? Um, I think this team is quite, I think as we've seen in the last few weeks, a quite good adaptable team. Um, I think we're happy to go with the flow. We trust what's around us and who's coaching us. So I think everyone's been sound with it. Um, and yeah, just trusting the management because they obviously know what they're talking about because they're here. And I think... Yeah, I think results are showing now as we come further a bit into the season, got used to everything. So yeah, I think just trusting everyone's being fine and all of the teams are now doing really well. So yeah. And this is a question for you both, Hannah, if you want to start and then pass on to Mike. Uh, now that we're six games into the uh, league season, what have you learned about this league? Has there been any surprises and have you had to change any of your targets? Um, I think we've learned that we can't ha have as many chances as we've had previously. Um, we've had like a few chances and it's been like oh it's fine like another one will come but with some games this season it's like you get one chance and if you don't um, do well that chance you like it could be um, a bit over so I think that's what we've learned but I also think we're expecting that it's obviously a big jump up from tier four so I think um, as much as a lot's changed we kind of expected it um, with some teams in our league being professional you're obviously going to get a lot harder opposition so yeah yeah, and back to you, Mike. Um, we've got a few questions for you now, potentially. Um, going into the forward game uh, the previous week, we had eight players unavailable. We saw Gesso return last weekend. Is there any updates on the rest of the squad? Yeah, so um, we're actually in, in really good place at the moment. Um, the Probably the big one to know, Mill is back in non-contact training. So we're expecting her return uh, very soon. Uh, Alex has been away, but purely and simply a work situation, so nothing to report there. You saw uh, Favour back on the weekend, Esme back on the weekend, a uh, number of faces return. Um, and what we've got now is a very competitive squad of 21 players. Um, we would be talking about 20, but Senna Robinson has arrived very sharply into the forefront of conversations. So um, we're in a brilliant position. and. Um, for the, the club and the group and another triple game week is looming so we're going to need probably all 21 of those very soon so got some big choices to make over the next few weeks but they're all made with kind of the next four or five games in mind uh, and then the start of the FA Cup run hopefully in November. Yeah, to you again, Mike. Uh, Kelsey Richardson, one of our latest signings, began the Stoke game as captain and had a brilliant performance as well in the match. Uh, what have you sort of made of her start to Starbridge? Yeah, <laughs> uh, Kelsey's Ron Seal is what I called her. She uh, is exactly what um, exactly what you see is, is exactly what you get. Um, she's a, a brilliant character who has played Tier 3 for a long, long time. Um, and we're not talking about a 32-year-old here. We're talking about a 24-year-old. So she is a, a wonderful addition to this club. Um, the perfect fit for the group that we have already, hardworking, gritty, but actually most importantly, just a lovely human. Um, I think that is already radiating to kind of, uh, well, I think the group knew it. I think the people in the stands are starting to see it. I think everybody watching our games can see the impact she's having, um, but she's not the kind of big and bullshit type, you know, she quietly goes about her business and actually brings everybody with her too. So I think that's what makes her a really good leader for this group um, and as she continues to grow in confidence um, you will see that wonderful right foot that she has that she hasn't shown you yet um, but she is a, a very exciting player uh, a brilliant person and we are very grateful to have her around yeah from moving on to another player that we've recently brought in um jay grove we brought her into bolster the attacking options that we have um, we saw her for the first time against uh, Stoke City. Um, she looked very, very strong upon entering the pit, um, field. Um, what are you hoping she can bring to this current group of players that we have? Yeah, so I was speaking to Jade, uh, speaking about Jade to one of her former managers today, and we were both fully in agreement that her ceiling is really high. 
So a, uh, a Jay Grove that is confident, flying around the pitch, um, doing what she does best, could play at a very high level of football. Um, she's had a bit of time um, over the pre-season away from um, competitive football. So, you know, she knows she's a project at the moment. She knows she's going to take some time, but you saw some really good glimpses of what she's capable of. She came on, she impacted the game. Um, she ran in behind really well. She linked up with other players really well. She ran channels when she needed to. So you will you will see the best of Jay to come in, in time. Um, but she is a wonderful addition. Once again, fits the persona of the squad, fits the personality. The good, smiley, happy girl um, who, who speaks really well. So same again, a, a really, really good addition to the group and one that fits most importantly. Mm. Just one for you here, Hannah. Um, how do you think the recent acquisitions have settled in? How are they in training? How have they integrated into the group? Fine, I think they're all lovely. Um, Kels is great, if you can understand her. Um, <laughs> I've, I've had to translate for a few girls what she's saying. Um, but yeah, no, I think they've both been really great, um, really lovely. Um, yeah, as I said, hard working, which is what this squad needs. Um, yeah, and I think, um, obviously Kels has been here a bit longer than Jade. Um, so I've got to know about Kels a bit more. Her communication on the pitch is really good and I think it's helped settle a lot of the midfielders, like including me, like talking and helping us out. Um, so I think that's really helped. And yeah, I saw Jade obviously playing Sunday and she looked really good. Um, so yeah, as Mike said, lovely people, great footballers, so they're flying, yeah. Yeah, and Mike, um, obviously, like we mentioned, a lot of the lot of the first team was unavailable uh, in the past few games. Is there anything that you specifically said to the group or how... Perhaps, perhaps you've, you've set up tactically, you know, having to compensate for those changes. Yeah, um, I think the biggest thing is we learn so much from the first four weeks. So whenever we played Wolves in the County Cup, Albion in the County Cup, we've always prepped well. We've always gone out on the pitch of a really solid game plan. The bit that you can't prep for is playing against people who play tier three every single week because that's an adjustment you know as a squad you have to adjust to that it takes time players who played centre midfield in tier four will be playing in different positions in tier three players who played you know for, for years of their life in a certain way have now had to adapt because every single week they're playing against that quality and what i think you've seen over the last six weeks is that process going on on the pitch so it's not just simply a case of you know kelts has come in and done a really good job and we've done this and we've done that actually the whole group has got better over the last six weeks. They've got smarter, we got used to the level. We know what we can get away with, we know what we can't get away with. I thought Sunday we against Stoke we were much more expressive. I think for the first time you saw a really free-flowing second half of football from us. You know, not to say that we were we were all over Stoke, but I think toe to toe, I think we played the most football in a half against a very good Stoke team that we've played against any tier three team all season. So you, we are, we are, we're a massive process, but adapting to this league takes time and the girls are doing a really good job every single week of getting a bit smarter and a bit better um, and you're starting to see the, the fruits of that already. Yeah, and um, we've recently seen a few of the um, pathway players um, progressing to the first team, Grace Rogers, Charlie Atkins and as you mentioned earlier, Senna Robinson play their part. What are your thoughts on their progression into the team? Probably two separate conversations here because I think Charlie and Grace have done brilliantly and they came up and they were patient and they got on the pitch and, and they worked hard and I spoke to them both on the Saturday night and I just said, look, you've got a brilliant opportunity here to come up and play with no pressure at all. With the eight, nine injuries that we had going into Fylde, it, it took all the pressure off us mentally and actually we knew it was a big game in the context of the season, but with all the injuries we had, the group had an excuse ready made if they wanted it, but actually they didn't they didn't want an excuse and we said to the girls before the game, just allow yourselves for a second to imagine walking on the coach with three points and I think you could see that in the game. They almost they for a second because they allowed themselves the the opportunity to feel like what it would look be uh, what it would be like to, to walk away with three points. I think um you saw a really good positive performance. So and Grace and Grace and Charlie were, were a part of that. They came on, they did their job. I don't think Charlie has ever been told she's playing centre forward before. And I, I don't think she ever imagined she would be playing centre forward in tier three. So 
but she came on and did exactly what we needed to do. Problem with the other story there is Senna Robinson, who I think has quietly taken the world by storm in the last week or so. Um, and and it's, it's not a case of she's dividing opinions. I think it's been very clear and very obvious that actually everybody sees why she is where she is. Um, and she's done brilliantly. Uh, and, and to throw her in the deep end, and you know she's got a lot of other shifts going on, so what people don't see is that she's moved, moved away from home and gone to university for the first time in the last two weeks. So actually, you've got all these, all these shifts going on, and now you're starting for the first team, having not seen the opportunity before that moment. So I, I cannot credit the, the girl enough. She's done so well. Um, she's a she's a funny little human if you ever get a chance to chat to her. But I think I think that's what makes Senna Senna. So um, what a what a brilliant story for for the whole club, the pathway, for Ken, for Mark, for everybody who's been involved in Senna's development before she got here. You know, Worcester giving her that opportunity in Tier Five and us getting the chance to to be involved in her football past that point. I think anybody who has been involved in Senna's football over the last X amount of years needs to needs to take a great amount of joy from seeing her do so well and similar to the rest of the group given time she will only get better so and for you Hannah from being on the field how do you see the progression of the youth developing into first team players how does um, it feel to play with them I love it I think it's really nice like um, I think even with Senna only playing a couple of games you can see the second game she can seem a lot more confident a lot more um, happy to do the things we know she can do um, so yeah um, I think they're all like, obviously very good all confident and I think with time, with more chances. I think this is a club to be at if you want to come through as a pathway and get into the first team as we've seen it. Um, so yeah, just as Mike said as well, again, great characters, great people. Senna's a little weirdo and I get on really well with weirdos, so do you know what I mean? So, yeah, um, no, it's been really good. And as I said, they've been class on the field, so yeah. Yeah, and uh, Mike, comparing this season to our last two seasons, it's fair to say it's been very, very different. You know, the, the goals and the ambitions are a lot more different. Um, has there ever, ever been, for you, any sort of doubts regarding the squad or regarding where we are as a club? No, I think I think last season, I, th I think you need to take last season. Um, what we did in, in a week from Sheffield to Lincoln was ridiculous. Um, and unheard of, and you've got to factor everything in. You know the fact that the, the squad were we were a confidence group at that point, and you know we had a, a tough week after Sheffield. Um, but really, if you'd have offered us fourth or fifth for the start of the season, we'd have probably gone. Actually, that's not too bad. Um, so I mean, last season we just gathered momentum. We always had it in the group, and I think the biggest thing is because the group worked so hard, so consistently, and we were so tough on ourselves whenever. We didn't win games like we wanted to win games, or when we drew games, you know, when we drew against Cavs here, the group battered themselves, and um, that's the reason why they win. They 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 won that league because their mentality was so good that I don't think anybody else was going to be in a place where they were going to be able to get fifty odd points on the board. And I, it was a freak season. Tier five, you know, we were in such a good place that it wasn't a given, but you know, we were we were really strong as a club at that point. This season has been exactly what. We thought it would be, you know, if you go back and you look at the results, we've lost to Nottingham Forest away, Wolves away, Derby at home. Um, you know, we were 1-0 down against Wolves for 70 minutes with 10 players, which is a massive achievement. We were in the second half against Forest, tidy things up, changed to something that would be a bit more sensible. And we only conceded one shot on target or two shots on target the whole of the second half. So the potential is there. Um, the tricky bit is is you're not going to walk into the division and go right. You know we want, you know we're going to do this and we're going to do that and we're going to dominate games. You know these are clubs who've been at this level for a long, long time. Plus they've all improved massively over the summer. So Derby have gone from training at their own facility for their women. Now they do everything with their men, as do Albion. You know, and then you've got those two who have improved, and then you go to the big guns. You talk about what what Forest and Burnley and Newcastle have done this summer and you go it's so great for women's football but you know when we spoke to all the people we, we you know we were speaking to this summer about what we need to do in the league and all of that they spoke about the league being three divisions and you can see it you know you've got tier four which felt like a, a genuine league of teams who are pretty much as good as each other maybe minus one or two and then all of a sudden you've walked into a league with 
some very, very capable teams, some teams who are championship ready, if not stronger than some championship setups. And our job is to continue to bridge the gap, but we're in the best possible place to do it because we're playing them every single week. So we're getting smarter, we're getting more intelligent and people are seeing it and buying in, which is always helpful. Yeah, and uh, this question I suppose could go to both of you, perhaps starting with yourself, Anna. Um, coming from a place like Birmingham City, how do you feel that has helped you personally? Um, I think it's helped me a lot, like technically and tactically. Obviously, um, being there throughout the kind of like 16s and 21s, it was a lot more focused on like um, like analysis and like tactically like that. So I think it's helped me have like a good understanding of the game in general. And now being in tier three, you have to do so everything so much quicker. I think that's where it's helped me from. Um, and yeah, so just kind of that grounds. Um, and then also physically, it's helped me a bit with early development because obviously we had quite a few gym sessions and SNC sessions. So doing it that way as well has helped me already feel a bit more stronger than I would have if I wasn't there basically. So yeah. Yeah, no, so I, I, the reason I went to Blues was to go and learn from other people. I think you know, you've know got to be careful of staying in the same environment and becoming a bit of an echo chamber. As a coach, you know, if you work with the same people for years and years and years and do things the same way and don't, don't give yourself the opportunity to learn from other people, then you fall behind as a coach. And it wasn't even about learning from people who, you know, who were like me. I, it was about kind of getting ideas from people who didn't coach like me at all and you know, we had contradicting ideas and sometimes we had the ideas that were the same, but that for me was really helpful. Um, the networking, just understanding the women's game a bit better, understanding kind of the environment that Ham came from with the WSL academies, but now PGAs and RTCs. And it was a really helpful time for me. I was, was gutted to, to leave, but at the same point, this project was exploding at the time and it would have been silly for me to do the academy, sorry, the Stavridge Academy, the, the women's first team and blue 16s kind of to an average extent or not as well as I would want it done when actually I could step back and, and do two of those projects much, much better. So really grateful to, to everybody at Blues, Paul, Paul Cowie, especially who's, who's, who's mad, but, but, you know, grateful to Paul and to, to Liam who, who I learned a lot from. Who is also mad. He was also <laughs> absolutely mad. Um, but uh, yeah, no, really, really important time. Yeah, and no, my final question again to you, Mike. Um, from the end of sort of last season, we've had a lot of players come in, but also a lot of players go in as well. Do you think this sort of squad dynamic has, has changed or has it stayed the same, do you feel? I think uh, what is really important to this football club um, is that we retain our identity. Um, the... The girls are amazing. Uh, we have built something so strong because we've retained our identity the whole way through. There, there is a Starbridge girl, you know, there's Kelsey, Han, Ayers, all the girls. I could, I could name all 20 of them. I don't know why I'm naming those three, but, but it. <laughs> yeah, you know, they're, they're, they're good humans who, who commit to football. They work really hard and that commitment issue is massive. You know, we, when you're talking about competing with and Nottingham Forest, who are a hybrid, Newcastle are full-time, what you're trying to do is replicate some of those structures, asking the girls to do some of those things away from football, asking staff who have full-time jobs to do stuff after work. You know, the, the, the input is massive. So the retaining the identity is important. If you're going to get in the trenches of anybody and you're going to go and battle for, you know, uh, to, to get sit for seventh in the league, in a, in, a, in a league like this, you need to be around people that you like and, and people that you can trust. Um, and, and there's 21 of them on, on the pitch every single week, which is really helpful. And, you know, there are some difficult conversations with, with people and, and game time, but that's football, that's management. And um, if you do everything with the best interests of the, uh, the group and the club at heart, then you don't tend to go wrong. Um, we don't mean to, anyway. <laughs> Yeah, I was gonna say, uh, our fr uh, friends and rivals on the uh, Wolves uh, podcast have uh, sent some uh, questions in, so for both of you to answer. So the first question they ask is, what's your favourite uh, Tier 3 stadium you've played in so far? Come on, you go first. Um, I think the Knotts ground, I can't remember what it was, but Long it was Eaton. Long Eaton, yeah, I thought that was really nice, really nice pitch. Um, 
I got a bit wet from the sprinklers, though. But, <laughs> but no, I thought that was really nice. They had a really nice setup there. Um, and the supporters were really good. Like, they were chanting, and Anthony had some competition. So, yeah, no, I thought that was a really nice place and a really nice ground. So, yeah. Yeah, no, it was brilliant. Telford was stunning, um, as I'm sure the Wolves supporters would be very happy to hear. Um, not as nice as the Molyneux. Um, <laughs> but Telford was, um, Telford was a really nice night. Um, Long eater. The biggest thing for us is is playing in front of fans is the be all and end all for us. You know the the atmosphere you'll get from it, and the War Memorial is a cauldron, so you really feel it there. But you know even at other grounds which don't necessarily have the same atmosphere, just seeing six hundred people there is 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 fantastic. And that first day against Nottingham Forest, as tough as it was, was a brilliant occasion. Um, so you know we just we love being a part of it. We really enjoy it. Um, and every single week coming out and putting on a show is part of what we talk about and, and showing the best of what we can do. Uh, yeah, so the second question they ask is what is the biggest difference from uh, Tier 4 to uh, Tier 3? I think we've kind of broached the commitment conversation and I think um, the, the Burnley manager, and she's going to kill me if I don't say her surname right, but Rebecca Saviour um, came out and said well done to everybody for all the travel you put in midweek. And I thought that was a, a really interesting tweet from from you know a top end tier three women's manager and you know she could be managing much higher of course but the commitment to, to be able to compete in this league is huge and you speak to players this summer and the conversations you're having are not about whether they're good enough it's about whether they can commit just the hours that are required you know it's not a case of training sessions you're talking about all of the bits that go alongside of it, your own gym work, your own recovery, your own diet, what supplements you're doing. You know, you, if you're in this league and you want to compete, you have to pretend, like pretend, you have to act like a full-time footballer, sometimes without the full-time part, you know, and, and, and the, that is massive. And I think as, as staff, as fans, as clubs, I think it's whenever we watch a game this season, you need to appreciate how much these girls commit to being on the pitch um, because it is it is a phenomenal commitment. Every player who travels or, you know, after work directly to training, spends two and a half hours at a training ground with X amount of time on footage, goes home and cooks a specific meal. I mean, we deserve massive credit and we're in, a, we're in a transition period in this league where some teams are part-time, some teams are full-time, some teams are hybrid, and, but everybody is trying to bridge the gap um, and everybody is committing to something that is a massive, you know, massive portion of their life at the moment. So can only respect everybody who does it. And that probably for us has been understanding quite what was needed um, and what's, what is going to be needed to win at this league has been the biggest step. But we're getting there and we, we're, we're learning the league very quickly. And the league's taught us some difficult lessons and we've had some brilliant moments. So. Yeah, I don't know whether you want to add anything to that. Oh, I think that was great. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, no, yeah, same really. Um, some of the girls have ridiculously long hour jobs. Um, I I get tired and I don't have a big job. So, um, <laughs> yeah, no, so I think that's a massive one. Um, and then also, as we said before, just the different like physical standards and stuff, um, which is why we're all having to go to the gym extra. So, <laughs> yeah. So yeah, the next question is, who's the best player you've come up against so far this season? Good question. Um, because of the, the type of footballer that I enjoy, Freya Thomas at Newcastle, uh, sorry, at Nottingham, he's unbelievable at football. Um, you could pick out so many from that day, but just what she offered physically that day, some of the runs in behind, you go back and watch the footage and... <laughs> I looked at a couple of players that, that she beat for, for pace off a piece of movement and I couldn't even, I wasn't even angry about their starting positions, you know, they weren't do, necessarily doing anything that I wouldn't expect them to do, but very simply, she, she was just absolutely ridiculous. Um, you could pick out so many, um, the, the, the Knotts girls were, were really impressive, um, the captain of Derby, I feel really bad for not remembering their name. Um, I know you're talking about, I can't remember either, but... Class, yeah, we did lots of scouting now. I've got yeah. my name, so sorry. Um, but she she was brilliant, um, and and it's a lot of fun to watch. You know, it's fun to watch our girls come up against these these incredible talents. And the biggest bit for us is we take so much joy out of being able to set up a plan for these girls and 
and, and kind of watch how the plan plays out and watching these like, learn from those kind of players and develop has been fun. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting. Amber Hughes is Amber Hughes. Um, she will always be Amber Hughes. You can have the best game plan in the world, but she'll pop up eventually. So uh, there's a lot of brilliant footballers in this league, and both those are three have stood out particularly. Oh, oh yeah, once again, I'd also agree with those. So yeah. Yeah, and so the uh, final question they ask: Who sits on the uh, ice box the best, Casey Stoney or Tash? It's not even a question, Taz, Taz Tesco. Mm. That ice box has yeah. been the bane of my life. It's <laughs> all um, we've heard since we came here. I want an ice box. <laughs> oh, she's brilliant. Um, yeah, definitely. Uh, Mike, Hannah, uh, thank you very much for joining us. We appreciate uh, how busy you are. Um, very best of luck uh, this Sunday against for the start in the Cup. And uh, we hope to see you again very soon. Thank you very much, guys. Thank you. Thank you.